I just wanted to welcome everyone uh, today. So sorry, Atea, and especially just share my big thanks to Atea Korakiwala for organizing this event today. Uh, Atea is one of our rising stars um, at the school, and I'm just um, so heartened by this conversation uh, on infrastructure, architecture, ecology, and so much more. So welcome. Thank you so much, Dean Andreas, uh, for your continuing support and uh, for getting making this event happen. Thank you, Lila, for bringing this event into being. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as uh, the Dean just mentioned, I'm Atiya Kurakiwala, Assistant Professor of Architecture here at Columbia University. I'm speaking from our campus in New York, um, which sits on the ancestral lands and unceded territory of the Lenape people who have suffered displacement through the settler colonialize, uh, colonization of Manhattan. Today's presentations and conversations revolve around the question of infrastructure, what it is and how we use it. Um, the word itself suggests something underneath the surface, but constitutive of that surface, something underneath that makes the surface possible. Infrastructure in a normative sense implies the prolific process of human intervention, progressively domesticating nature to connect and facilitate human life. Yet the numerous ways in which we have seen infrastructure fail in the last year among others hint that there might be something missing in the definition of infrastructure as matter that moves matter. The immediate provocation for this panel was the migrant crisis last year. After India went into lockdown in March, 2020, a record number of migrants walked from the city homewards towards their village, uh, villages and towns. One of the images of this massive administrative failure that stayed with me was that of people crowded amid a pandemic waiting at the Bandra train station in Mumbai um, upon information that the trains were going to restart when in fact the lockdown was extended yet multiple times over. In India, housing is sometimes categorized as infrastructure and this is for budgetary reasons so that infrastructure spending can be dispersed towards producing much needed affordable um, housing. Migrants who often labor on these housing and infrastructural projects in cities walked hundreds of kilometers to their villages and towns precisely because they didn't have, access, uh, didn't have homes, that is access to housing infrastructure in the city. In this context, extrapolating from someone like Dr. Sai Balakrishnan's work, it is possible to imagine that infrastructure privileges the movement of capital and commodities before it does the movement of human bodies. And so perhaps infrastructure only moves matter as a side effect of moving wealth. Then there is the question of violence. Violence here can be described by the ca uh, callous disregard for human life and suffering, even as uh, development projects are propagandized as built for people. This disregard sits atop the ecological devastation that infrastructure has wrought and facilitated, which in turn enacts what someone like Rob Nixon has called slow violence of, uh, upon the environments and bodies of the poor. Today's conversation aims to think these infrastructures as they relate to violence historically. How do we locate them in longer narratives of colonial extractivisms? That is, how is infrastructure articulated in the landscape uh, in an extractive colony? How did these infrastructural desires get articulated and recycled um, through the techno-scientific rationalities of post-colonial development? How has a politics of ever extra expanding extractivism located itself on the bodies of working people? Finally, how can we think in, of infrastructure as constituted not by tar, bitumen, concrete, and steel, and instead by the feet of the people who use it, the arms that carry the rock in the stone and the bodies that inhabit it? How can we write that history of infrastructure? With that, I want to introduce you to our three speakers today. Each of our speakers will speak for about 15 minutes. And after that, we will open the floor to questions, which I hope will take the form of a dialogue between all of us. Our first speaker is Professor Shati Chattopadhyay, 
She is Professor of History of Art and Architecture at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Professor Chattopadhyay is an architect and architectural historian specializing in modern architecture and urbanism and the cultural landscape of the British Empire. Um, her book, Representing Calcutta, and her essay, Blurring Boundaries, have been constitutive of new methodologies of thinking urban form from the field of architectural history. And her other, her other very important work, Unlearning the City, Infrastructure in a New Optical Field, critiqued normative and technocratic definitions of infrastructure and proposed new vocabularies for speaking the city. She continues to write on the subject, arguing that we need to unlearn the discourses that enact violence and produce new discursive and material architectures to inhabit. Uh, and today she'll present some of that work. Uh, our next speaker is Professor Rebecca M. Brown. She is professor and chair of the Department of History of Art at Johns Hopkins University. Her scholarship in South Asian art and architectural history spans the 19th and 20th centuries. Her book, Art for a Modern India, brought forth the contradictions between modernisms and modernization in India in how the paradoxical framing of um, progress versus history shaped modernist aesthetics themselves. Her other book, Displaying Time, the many temporalities of the festival in, of India vividly describes the minute durations within the politics of display at the cusp of liberalization and neoliberalization under the, that took place under the prolific architectural figure of the tent, of the festival tent. Today, she will speak on K.R. Panikar's founding and building of the artist's village um, at Chula Mandal in the 1960s. Our third speaker today is Dr. Avishek Ray. He is Assistant Professor of Humanities and Social Sciences at the National Institute of Technology in Silchar. Dr. Ray's research is concerned with moving bodies, um, tourists, vagabonds in the 19th and 20th centuries. And if I can be so bold to editorialize, his work makes a case for thinking infrastructure as made by the bodies that use it. Infrastructure in his work is first the feet of the feet that walk on it. He has written extensively on the different ways in which the pandemic has inverted mobility regimes while preserving the security of India's rich while, and reinforcing the vulnerability of these bodies who labor, whose labor made the pandemic induced immobility of India's upper classes possible. And I imagine he will share um, ideas from this work today. Thank you for joining our conversation. And with that, I welcome Shwati to begin with her presentation. Thank you, Ateya. I'm going to share my screen. So let me begin by posing a question. Are there instances of state or corporate infrastructures that are not violent? In different degrees, all physical infrastructures, roads, railways, canals, airports, utility lines, are violent, often deadly interventions. They're constructed by interfering with the soil, gradient, and drainage of an area. They disrupt wildlife and host of habitats besides human habitation. They affect the quality and experience of airspace. The spatial logic of such infrastructures confronts and proliferates a range of socio-structural inequities on a daily basis. Our collective shock in witnessing the brutal withholding of infrastructure, in this case, the railways from migrant workers as a strategy of confinement is founded on an assumption a trust that the state controlled infrastructures are meant to enable social life. In what follows, I want to bring together three figures that became visible in the COVID crisis, railways, strategies of containment, and infrastructure in a capacious sense, to think through the biospatial, that is the spatial organization of life and death. Infrastructures by, by definition, lines of control, the investment opportunities and techniques of appropriation. India's rail network grew at a fast pace after 1861. This was no technological inevitability. The rapid growth in the post Sepoy rebellion decades spatially mirrored the growth of military cantonments. So if we simply weigh the affordances against the depredations that infrastructures produce, we miss a very few, we miss, a, certain dimensions about infrastructure in the way that it operates. So this is my point. 
we need to look at not what it is as an artifact, but its modality, what it does and how it does it. Infrastructures enable and dif disable differentially. Our blindness to its differential purchase is a result of the way we privilege infrastructure as representational space, its strategic and symbolic use. Infrastructure as representational space relies on relation among infrastructures, ones that are not often evident if we focus on the artifact and its construction. To disaggregate infrastructure, we need to attend to the infra in infrastructure, the workings that remain below the threshold of visibility. Only in moments of crises, these workings are revealed. I've been looking at the relation between infrastructure and sovereignty, focusing on some pivotal events of the 19th and 20th century in India, to see how infrastructure was conceptualized and mobilized, how it was staged as representational space, how it was normalized. One of the issues that interest me is the relation between infrastructure and martial law, and how that generates a racially grounded biospace. So I'll share some notes from the Santal Rebellion of 1855. Between 1780 and 1840, the Santals, a peripatetic a people, had been herded into an area called Dominico in Eastern India on the borders of present-day West Bengal and Jharkhand. The objective was to use Santal labor for clearing jungles for cultivation. In 1832-33, the Damin, an area of approximately 1400 square miles, was constructed as a bounded space to control the interaction of Santals with the surrounding indigenous society. Initially marked by natural features and pillars, the Damin boundary was strengthened and made absolute by police stations at small intervals. As Pratama Banerjee notes, it was also argued that the boundary must be made precisely mathematical and in straight lines wherever possible. Natural features, the government argued, tended to be tampered by the primitives and by nature itself. The Santal's bounded space meant that they no longer could avoid the colonial state. Santal villages as mobile assemblies became spatially fixed, thus creating new boundary disputes that required the mediation of the state. The Santals were subjected to ruinous interest rates by moneylenders and the complaints went unheeded in the colonial court. The British administrator in charge of the Damin made Santal's experiment with new cash crops. Forced to extend cultivation beyond a fertile stretch, the crops became vulnerable to natural disasters and this made them completely dependent on the discretionary rights of the colonial state to forego revenue claims. The Damin was crisscrossed with roads built by the state in an effort to chase after the Santals who wanted to flee from this bondage. Having divorced Santal society from freely exchanging goods with outsiders, the colonial state instituted marketplaces for the sale of goods from the outside world, including English long cloth, caps, and jackets. Exchanging goods for money was expected to civilize the Santals who refused to produce a surplus of everything. All transactions with other groups were mediated in and through the colonial marketplace other locations of trade being prohibited in the Damil. The Santal Rebellion constituted a wholesale challenge to the codes that defined the Damin as representational space. On one fine day, the British administrators and the Bengali landlords and moneylenders suddenly recognized that the so-called peace-loving Santals had rebelled against colonial authority. The officiating magistrate of Bhagalpur hastily penned a, a note to William Gray, the secretary of the Bengal government in Calcutta in the failing light of 9th July, 1855. My dear Gray, I write a line in a great hurry to let you know that the Santals of this district have risen to take possession of the country. And, and as they are in considerable force, the police of these districts will not be able to stop them. So I write to ask you if you think fit to get order passed for the sending of troops 
for rail, as far as they can go, to the roads by which the Santals will be most likely to return home. The natives are in a great state of consternation. The railway people are arming and barricading themselves in various places. The dock, that is the post, is just about to go. I'm in a great hurry. Nominal reading shows Richardson trying to assemble the state infrastructure. In response, Gray wrote to Richardson, produce maps, he said. The administrators worried that the insurrection would spread to adjacent communities, which it did, and that the army or the police had no military advantages when fighting the Santals in the forest, their quote unquote native habitat. The Santals proficient hunters knew paths and trails that were unrecognizable to colonial authorities. The sites of colonial authority that marked the landscape, the bungalow, court, police station, railway, post office, the offices of landlords, their residences, and the marketplace were picked out by Santals as specific targets of insurgency. They disrupted the colonial communication system by destroying the infrastructure that aided the relation between the state, the moneylender, and the landlord. While the Santals took control of the sign systems that marked the colonial landscape, the colonial state appeared hobbled by its own governing practices and mode of envisioning the landscape. The state could only apprehend this, the rebellion in terms of its own infrastructure and the conception of space and representational practices congruent with such infrastructure. Practices that were based on a desire for exactitude, certainty, permanence of objects carrying fixed meaning and discrete bounded events that could be placed in a narrative of cause and effect. Most disturbing to authorities was not the pitched battles that the Santals fought with the colonial troops, which after some initial setbacks, the colonial armed forces handily won. But when the Santals were seemingly going about their everyday business, harvesting, mending buildings, hunting and celebrating. Prior to the insurrection, none of these actions had appeared particularly significant, let alone hostile to the administrators. These practices of everyday life had remained invisible, so to speak. During the rebellion, the colonial authorities suddenly confronted the spectacularism of the Santals every day. They were gathering in large numbers, digging tanks and earthworks, building large storehouses and pavilions to conduct the Hindu festival of Durga Puja. The problem was that even if many of these activities were symbolically defined, they could not be sorted out of the normalcy of every day to be described as crime. Arrests were Arrests were futile because no colonial court could punish them. There was scarcely any evidence of overturning authority in the normal acts of carrying axes or celebrating a Brahminical ritual. The everyday entered the colonial archive only when it had exceeded its norms and had taken on a particular visible form through the magnification of scale. The Santals self-consciously mimicked the formal conventions of the colonial army in organizing their own forces and chose to partake in high caste rituals, which they did not ordinarily. The Santals were switching cultural codes to assert the form and formality that could be recognizable to colonial authorities. And in that moment of switching codes, their everyday appeared visible. They were speaking in the code of their opponents. They wanted the colonial state to read these insurrectional acts as insurrectional. Put another way, the Santals were using insurrectionary tactics to create an infrastructure. This elicited further demand to strengthen the very infrastructure that was under attack. Colonial officers and European railway staff in the district asked to have the quote unquote gaps between the military and civil stations reinforced and urged that the railways and telegraph be extended to military stations to the north without further delay. The impossibility of apprehending the Santals in the situation of the everyday resulted in the administrators demanding martial law in the Santal districts. So what passed as normality could be viewed as criminality without obstacles posed by a civil court of law. But the need for martial law was also articulated 
as the necessity of dealing with the Santal as a figure of excessive violence that could erupt without notice. This in turn became a rationale for summary executions and burning of Santal villages as a strategy for putting down the rebellion. Martial law as infrastructure created the legibility that the colonial state needed to define the rebellion. After the rebellion, the entire Dhamin was reorganized, spatially and administratively, to form a separate non-regulation district, the Santal Perganas. A non-regulation district implied that the civil and criminal procedures that governed the rest of the region were held in abeyance in this enclave. Laws and regulations that were applicable to the rest of Bengal were found to be, quote unquote, unsuited to so uncivilized a race. A deputy commissioner with four assistants were placed in charge of the non-regulation district, all of whom were vested with civil as well as criminal jurisdiction. The justification suggested that the complex procedural formality of colonial English law was to be abandoned in favor of more informal, paternalistic relation between the deputy commissioner and the tribal Santals. The solution then was not to strengthen the formal infrastructure to the colonial judiciary for the benefits of the Santals, to enable them to access the system, but to remove them farther from it. The Santal Perganas as a space of exception constituted one more of a series of spatial disloc dislocation for the Santals. Throughout the latter half of the 19th century, the Santal Perganas became the prime catchment area for supplying coolie labor to the tea plantations in the Northeast. It is not a coincidence that the tea plantations in the Western Dwars and Darjeeling were non-regulation tracts as well, an important condition that allowed the planters to regulate without the intervention of the judiciary, the mobility and working conditions of the laborers. Now, this kind of practice was not atypical and we find it repeated in the Savoy Rebellion and scores of other insurrections before and after. In conclusion, I want to emphasize the infrastructural role of martial law using maps that accompanied the Disorders Inquiry Committee Report of 1920, commonly known as the Hunter Committee Report. This was convened to inquire into the disturbances in Western and Northern India between March and May 1919. The disorders, as they were referred to, followed the enactment of the Rollout Act that indefinitely extended the emergency measures of the Defense of India Act put in place during the First World War. That reaffirmed the state's right to contain the Indian population from freely moving around. And among its many clauses, it allowed the creation of new categories of offense. Matters came to a head when Mohandas Gandhi was prevented from leaving the Bombay presidency. He left anyway and on attempting to enter the Punjab district was arrested. Protests erupted in small and large towns and the Punjab was effectively placed under military control. The Hunter Committee was convened following public outrage about military killings in Jallianwalabak and Amritsar. And also because of the use of martial law. This included the dropping of bombs in Gujranwala because it would have taken too long for the troops to arrive by rail. In most areas, third-class rail travel was prohibited to contain the population from moving around. The opinion passed by the majority of British members of the committee was that the unrest was in the nature of a rebellion against British administration, thereby the imposition of martial law was necessary and therefore the killings that happened in towns such as Amritsar and Gujranwala were unfortunate but justified. The minority opinion by the three Indian members read the same documents contrarily and argued that it was not a rebellion, which presumes premeditation and organized action. And the invocation and extension of martial law was unjustified. We can't get into the details of the debate here, but it suffices to say that the debate was about what constitutes rebellion and whether the colonial state in this case was indeed facing a rebellion. The maps of the Punjab were intended to provide the grounds for arguing this was a rebellion. 
Noting the locations of where telegraph wire was cut by protesters and the location of arson, murder, and other outrages. Notice the language in the reference. The fences included burning up the King Emperor's photograph. The map of Amritsar, where the Jalinwalabagh killings happened, specifically noted the locations where Europeans were assaulted or killed marked here by the you know, red cross and the red cross in the circle. So it's locations which are here and here and here. As a text of counterinsurgency, the assaults on Europeans and on government buildings and the sites of proclamation of military rule, which are here, all these red dots, were set up as the infrastructure of rebellion and evidence of a besieged government. What it didn't show was how many Indians died in the conflict between April 10th and 13th. Importantly, General Dyer's decision to gun down an, arm, an unarmed gathering in Jalinwalabagh was not specifically indicated. Rather, the military action that presupposed rebellion in a circuitous logic became the evidence of rebellion on the ground. The minority report attempted to delineate the limits of necessity and arrived at the conclusion that martial law was not simply what we would now call a tool of biopolitics, but it was a tool of the biosocial, intended on demarcating the rulers from the road. They did not produce a counter map, but condemned Dyer's argument that the killing was necessary to produce a moral effect. A nominal modification of that map might give a different sense of the modality of civil and military infrastructure in the way they reciprocate each other and set up an intimacy between biopolitics and the biosocial. Thank you. Thank you, Shanti. We'll uh, now move on to Rebecca. Thanks very much. I'm thrilled to be here and um, really excited to take part in this conversation. This is my first foray into these questions around infrastructure and thinking about that as a way of, of dealing with some of my material. So I really welcome any thoughts and comments. In 1966, then principal of the Madras School of Art, KCS Punnaker, founded the Chola Mandal Artists Village between the sea and the main Madras Mahabalipuram Road. Recognizing that many graduates ended up finding careers outside of art making, Panikar created spaces at the art school for students to learn crafts of various types, batik, wood carving, jewelry, that could be sold as crafts and in turn support the other artistic pursuits he, his faculty, and his students wished to engage in, primarily painting and sculpture. Panikar also was intimately aware of the dearth of commercial fine art galleries supporting contemporary art in the 1950s and 60s. Finding an audience and by extension a market for contemporary art was impossible without these structures in place. Thus, Panikar's founding of Chola Mandal Artists Village creates a piece of art world infrastructure in a context where a shared space for discussion, criticism, debate, and creativity was largely absent. Over the next few decades, Cholamandal achieved much of the vision Panikar had in mind for it. Artists purchased or helped to purchase small plots of land, built homes and studios in community with one another, carved out shared performance discussion and exhibition spaces, including a gallery, and continued to support themselves with craft sales via domestic and international buyers and to the travelers on the main road headed to tourist destinations further south. So while Chola Mandal clearly operated as an infrastructure through which artists could find paths towards living and working as artists, I'd like to consider the village as a counter infrastructure, one that worked against the grain of larger capital and political forces at the time. Now the artist village, I wanna also argue was not anti-infrastructural. It absolutely constituted a network of people and a built environment all of which was dependent on larger flows of capital and people in the region. But it carved out a place for countering the prevailing norms in a region, Madras State, Madras State at the time and later Tamil Nadu, 
which was focused primarily on performing arts and music, and to create a space of belonging for a group of people, the artists, from across linguistic and regional divides. And as Karin Zitzowicz shows us in the context of the art of the 90s and the 2000s, this counter infrastructure did not operate as a passive field on which artists worked. The counter infrastructural network of Cholamundal deeply shaped and was shaped by the art practices of its participants. So the first, I have two counter infrastructures I wanna lay out in the time I have today. The first is fine art, not performing art. So one of the maxims spoken by many contemporary Chennai residents when discussing painting in the visual arts, and I'm talking here mostly of elite Chennai residents today, is that historically Madras has had little interest in these arenas, devoting its primary attention and energy to the arts of music and dance. The maxim spoken today hides a good deal of the class, caste, and linguistic politics that underlie the emphasis, not just on dance and music, but on particular forms of those arts. One infrastructure then that Cholamundal countered was this strand of classicizing dance and music that operated on two tracks, as some of you may already know. On the one hand, a Sanskritized text-based constructed Paratnatyam dance and the Telugu derived Karnatak music both largely Brahmin-led and positioned as pan-Indian traditions, sanitizing and de-eroticizing and consolidating a multitude of earlier forms. On the other hand, the Tamil Isai or Tamil music movement was part of a larger pure Tamil language movement that had emerged forcefully in the region via anti-Hindi protests in the late 1930s and again in the mid 1960s and found its political purchase in a succession of Dravidian anti-Brahmin political parties, including the DMK, or culminating really in the DMK. The particularities of the cultural politics then of Madras state in this period created a framework in which art that did not have a performance or a classicizing thread at its center, that is all of the art that KCS Panikkar was trying to support, painting, printmaking, drawing, ceramics, sculpture, that art had a comparative disadvantage finding economic patronage and political support. Against that frame, Punnaker's drive to establish the Artists Handicraft Association and fund the Cholamundal Artists Village can be read as a countering move to an infrastructure, a discursive political economic infrastructure that could not recognize modern and contemporary art as legitimate. And in some ways this really dovetails with what Ashati was saying about the recognition of the Santal sort of insurgency infrastructure, right? Poniker is trying to create something that's recognizable in the face of not being recognized. All right, so that's the first counter infrastructure. The second one I wanna talk about is maximal language diversity. This is the counter infrastructure two. So this probing of the discourse around dance and music in Madras opens up my second counter infrastructure, the push against linguistic and ethnic politics. Cholamundal is founded in 1966, a moment that positions uh, the, the village in relation to the deeply felt and often violent anti-Hindi pro-Tamil protest movements that, took the, that shook the country during this decade. A major reorganization of India's states on linguistic lines took place in the 1950s, splitting off the Northern Telugu speaking portion of Madras state to form Andhra Pradesh. These national level political machinations meant a consolidation of the Southern portion of Madras state around a largely, although not entirely Tamil speaking population. As Sumati Ramaswamy narrates in her wonderful book on the history of devotion to Tamil as a language and as a goddess, in 1964, a man named Chinasami set himself on fire shouting, death to Hindi may Tamil flourish. He was followed by five others in the following year. Two years after Chinasami's suicide, in the midst of these changes across the 1950s and 1960s, Chola Mundal's founded. On one level, this is just a correlation or a coincidence. And I will tell you that my conversations with people who remember the founding of Chola Mundal and are still alive today, they don't, when I push them on this even, they don't recognize this connection. So, 
I'm sort of arguing this as a as a sort of subtle underlying again looking back at Shwati's paper a kind of um, invisible underlying layer of infrastructure. Um, so, but the major political focus of the decade leading up to Cholamandal's founding, extending to the reclaiming of the state as Tamil Nadu, renaming of the state as Tamil Nadu or land of the Tamils in 1969, involved ethnic linguistic battle lines, ones inflected with a deeply felt devotional movement and overwritten with caste politics. As someone born in Coimbatore to a Carolan Malayali family who spoke Malayalam, Tamil and English, surrounded by artists from across Southern India and beyond, who themselves occupied what Ramaswamy calls following Rosie Predotti, a nomadic consciousness of a polyglot, always in between languages and homes. How could Panikkar not feel the pressure of the ethno-linguistic politics that swirled and came to a head during this long decade? I propose that Cholamandal, while usually seen as a counter infrastructure to the dominant dance music regime in the region, as I outlined before, can also be read as a counter to the emergent ethnic and linguistic infrastructures being built to exclude the polyglot artist crowd Panikkar had nurtured at the Madras School of Art. What's more, and I'm sharing my screen again. Panikkar himself changes his idiom in the 1960s from experimentations with floating ethereal figural forms and garden jungle landscapes to, in 1963, the series that he would continue until his premature death in 1977, a series called Words and Symbols. How does one counter an infrastructure centered in language politics and exclusion? I suggest that Panikkar answers this not only with the founding of Chola Mandal, but also in an artistic practice that directly takes on the question of language, meaning, and belonging. And what's more, we might also say that this artistic practice itself counters not only the regional exclusionary politics of language and ethnicity, but also counters by cha charging over its exclusionary boundaries, the European and American centered modernist art infrastructures. Panikkar's work itself thus turns back to language, the language of painting, color, line, texture, the communica communicative potential of symbol in mathematics, science, and religion, and the twinned practices of reading and writing. Panikkar's painting in the 1963-64 year, and I'm showing you here one from 64, shifts dramatically to explore the power of text, diagram, and symbol, drawing on a wide range of citations from across a across visual cultures and notational practices. He uses math equations, geometry, and other imagery related to science in dialogue with astrological charts and symbols drawn from Carolan practices of magic. He uses text, Roman script, and a hint of English at first, as you can see here, and then shifting to the script used to write Malayalam, sometimes spelling out words from both that language and Sanskrit, sometimes spelling out nothing. As I've argued elsewhere, this work draws you in to decode it, only to rebuff any attempt at doing so, forcing a confrontation with how we know what we know and whether these sign systems, each designed to parse a complex universe, might themselves always fall short of transmitting understanding or knowledge. In the rich context of the founding of Cholamandal, plans for which were well underway as he started his words and symbols journey, Panikkar's turn to script and writing takes on new salience as a politicized language, excuse me, a politicized challenge to the language politics of the time. In a multilingual society, one in one which Filipino art, art critic Marian Pastoroses might characterize as a space of maximal language diversity. Panikkar gives us a language that can be read but not understood, or at least not understood as we might understand by reading a packet passage of text. Panikkar's gambit to explore language is bound up with an artistic project of claiming for himself the genealogy of not only the artistic history of the subcontinent, but truly of the world. Here I see him turning in words and symbols to rework and rethink the philosophical and pedagogical work that Paul Clay and others in the Bauhaus did in relation to thinking through a new language of painting 
in the early decades of the 20th century. So one of the things I'm interested in is setting up this idea of the linguistic politics of Tamil and other Southern Indian languages and anti-Hindi movements in relation to the language of painting. This language of painting includes text. Often, as you can see in the Paul Clay example I've pulled here, a lot of text, but it puts it in dialogue with the other elements of painting, including color and its communicative power, line, texture, brushwork, the layering of pigment, the use of figural, animal, and linguistic forms detached from their referent, the engagement with music and spoken text as a way of working through the materiality of paint. One might therefore see his move to the textual in his painting as a double counter, as it creates a new infrastructure for thinking the language politics in Southern India and a new infrastructure for thinking about the relation to the art of Europe as the hegemonic infrastructural center of artistic modernism. I'll conclude by turning back to the question of an infrastructure of violence that Atea very productively prompted us with, or the sense that infrastructures enable certain violences. Indeed, material bodily violence is not far from reach in this political and historical context, grounded as it is in protests and self-immolations of the 1960s. And I'm showing you here the Baltimore Sun coverage of the self-immolations from that time. I don't want to dismiss that nor to undermine the, <clears throat> the difficulties and challenges faced by Panikar and others who strove to work productively as artists and as not quite fully Tamilian in a context that increasingly thought, sought to exclude them. I see Panikar, however, countering this with an infrastructure not of violence, but of care. And I see this infrastructure of care a counter to the primary perhaps hegemonic infrastructures of the state and of prevailing cultural politics as an example of what queer theorists have called productive failure. Panikar never claimed the Cholamundal project was an intervention that would last forever. Indeed, if you talk to those still working as artists in Cholamundal today, many will repeat this idea that it was not meant to be permanent. At present, Cholamundal's caretakers have sought to institutionalize the museum and gallery spaces on the site, but real estate realities and the ever-expanding excerpts of Chennai have meant that it no longer serves as a residential commune for artists alone. This further underscores the temporal quality of a counter infrastructure. It intervenes, creating a modified space for lives that might incrementally challenge the prevailing norms, but then it fades or alternatively is co-opted into the prevailing infrastructure, losing its countering quality. Cholamandal remains, however, a productive failure, if indeed it is a failure at all. And for the linguistic caste and ethnic diversity of artists working in the Madras School of Arts, this, this counter infrastructure really pushed against the primacy of mu music and dance and cleared a space for them. And these were incredibly powerful moves that enabled the efflorescence of Panikar, whose infrastructures of care supported an incredible group of artists for a short time in the second half of the 20th century. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, and we will now turn to Abhishek. Yeah, it's, uh, thanks Atiya for inviting me and uh, it's absolute uh, pleasure to take uh, part in the conversation. And as a cultural and literary uh, studies person, I'm going to talk about uh, metaphors, not uh, so much about history, but uh, I'll talk about walking uh, as enacted by the migrant uh, workers uh, in India during the pandemic. So I'll see that uh, act as uh, a, a metaphor, but also let me uh, tell you at one point of time, Rebecca talked about Rosie, Rosie Braidotti's concept of uh, the nomadic subjectivity. So I'll depart from there. So I uh, see the walk as performed by the uh, migrant workers as necessarily nomadic uh, in the sense that Rosie Braidotti and uh, Michel Desartu and, and a bunch of other scholars uh, invoke it. So I'm going to talk about uh, the act of walking, as I say, uh, as a metaphor and also the highway as, as, as an infrastructure and how both of them have connected in the context of the uh, pandemic. So my presentation reflects on the dissenting act of mobility precisely in the sense of nomadic uh, subjectivity as articulated by the migrant workers in India who during the nationwide lockdown amid the pandemic are walking back home 
uh, literally hundreds of uh, miles away in lieu of uh, public uh, transport. So their mobility, uh, as in the act of uh, walking, has thus acquired a me metaphoric uh, status and laid bare the ideological practices of territorializing the city space. So this presentation argues that uh, the migrant workers' mobility from within the axiomatic of the prevalent uh, mobility regime can be read as a powerful metaphor of our tensions with the global political economic order that the pandemic has so uh, starkly uh, exposed. So in modern Athens, and I quote uh, Michel Dissart to here, uh, uh, the vehicles of mass transportation are called metaphori. To go to work or uh, to go uh, to home, one takes metaphor, a bus, or a train. Uh, so that's uh, the Athenian use of uh, the word me metaphor. So public transports, as in, are, are referred to as uh, metaphor. So metaphors are literary in as much they are spatial. So my presentation demonstrates how the spatial and the literary switches places in the context of the migrant workers' mobility, which renders the walk metaphoric. The metaphoric aspect of mobility is thus illuminated by its uh, spatial uh, aspect. So in the wake of the so-called urban turn, the city space is imagined as mappable, greedable, and perfectly segregable. This furnishes an imaginary uh, borderland within the uh, city. I mean, the way we imagine uh, city these days uh, is, is, is bas basically envisioning of uh, enclaves within uh, enclaves. So territorial techniques of urbanization, uh, what we may refer to as city making, uh, furnish urban uh, enclaves. So in Boston, for example, the Uber app is twice likely to cancel rides booked by uh, Afro-American riders. I mean, there's a very interesting paper on this, how uh, the Uber ride applications is grossly racialized. Uh, some city roads, for instance, feature separately demarcated tracks for bicyclists, and uh, we all know that Google traffic app, for example, offers user-based navigation solutions customized for cars, two-wheelers, pedestrians, bicycles, and so on and so forth. So certain gated communities, for example, restrict the mobility of certain occupational communities beyond uh, their gates. So in a sense, with uh, what I try to point with these examples is how imaginary borderlands realign the geographies of the city, and in doing so, furnish an enclavist identity, not only for those who thus imagine the city, but also for uh, these certain, certain interstitial heterotopic uh, communities, uh, in our case being the migrant worker, but also if we could extend this set of uh, examples, this might cover the maid, the food delivery personnel, the, uh, the bicyclist, and, and so on. So this separatist undercurrent thus restrains certain forms of urban mobility based on an imagined taxonomy that deems certain practices of mobility as degenerative and others virtuous. Uh, it institutes a rupture between uh, acceptable and unacceptable practices of mobility from within the framework of this cultural polarity, the migrant worker's work is symbolic of a certain socio-spatial production. The migrant worker is an urban outcast to begin with, but, in, but an important source of uh, surplus labor. Uh, so they must inhabit uh, heterotopic spaces, and I'm drawing on uh, Foucault here. So they must inhabit heterotopic uh, spaces, slums, squares, rookeries, and so on within the city, yet they are exteriorized from the coordinates of urban speciality. However, amid the lockdown, migrants do not have the subsistence to stay put in the city. Public transport is withdrawn and the interstate borders are sailed. They are thus forced to walk home. So in other words, what I'm trying to suggest is, I mean, there's a uh, visibilization of uh, these migrant workers who are otherwise, uh, rend who has been rendered uh, invisible. So out of the heterotopic ghettos, they are now walking right on the highways. Today, the phenomenon of migrant worker walking on the highway has become a symbolic uh, landmark and, of course, uh, made international news, not, because, not least because it serves as a sequential exposition of the territoriality of, sit of the city from under the veneer of urban speciality that had rendered them heterotopic and their mobility peripheral. Migrant workers have populated the highways at a moment when no one else can step out of their homes. Typically, highways are not meant for walking. Walking is prohibited on the highways. In that sense, the migrant workers' walk is double, doubly subversive. They are walking on the highway, which is shut down during the nationwide lockdown, 
as an infrastructural network, the highway, ironically, in most instances built by the migrant worker herself, bridges and sustains the city. So in other words, like uh, so the highway which has been built by the migrant worker is prohibited uh, for, for, for walking. So in that in that sense, uh, it's, it's doubly uh, subaltern. So it leads to it as in the highway leads to and emerges from the city. It is not inside of the city yet. In a sense, it is integral to city making. So without the highway, the city would be reduced to an island. So this ambiguous status of the highway transposes into the city's relationship with the migrant workers as they choose to walk across the highway. The highway is a transversal site where the walk unfolds in the context of what Kevin Lynch calls imageability of the city points to the wider ramifications for the metaphorization of the walk. It disrupts the fixity of urban cartographies and ascribed identities, that is the enclaves migrant workers are otherwise relegated to. The banishment of the migrant workers from the city is an act of cabotage. Establishing a right to remain in the city means a territorial claim. The liminal practice of determining who belongs in the city and who does not who retains the privilege of mobility and who does not is central to the territorial imagination of the city space. Migrant workers' walks are a condition of forced mobility arising from the lockdown amid the pandemic crisis. However, it becomes semiotically potent in the context of how currently in India an immobility regime has uh, prevailed. Of course, this is not specific to India, but I mean, what a point uh, to to to. Uh, what, what I try to point in this context that the migrant worker is walking uh, precisely in an immobility regime. So its cultural signification is derived from the paradoxes of the issues of mobility within the framework of neoliberal capitalism. Neoliberal capitalism itself is a regime of extreme mobility. And if you could uh, invoke Bauman here, uh, it's an extreme mobility of people, goods, labor, and so on and so forth. Uh, what what uh, John Uri has famously called the new mobilities paradigm. But it is still largely a privilege. What is most intriguing about this pandemic is that it exposes how in a political economic order in which extreme mobility is the norm, any attempt to impose a regime of immobility, that is the lockdown, will inevitably temporarily at least general, gen sorry, excuse me, will generate the opposite of extreme mobility. In other words, extreme mobility begets extreme counter mobility. What characterizes the migrants mobility, however, is its forced and peripheral nature, both in terms of the economic forces that precipitated the imperative of having to migrate for work, and now the loss of work forcing them to return home. What this pandemic is conversely exposing is the so-called freedom of immobility, playing out across the world in vastly different, but predominantly class-based contexts. Those who retain autonomy in the new mobilities paradigm are those in the upper middle class occupations who can afford to be sedentary for an exception, and during the lockdown can continue to work from home, procure deliveries and things like uh, grocery shopping and courier mail, and shield themselves from the virus while the migrant worker is forced to be mobile, oftentimes in service of the former. So I'll stop here and uh, maybe I'll, I'll, if you have doubts uh, and questions, I'll be able to clarify it in the discussion session. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I want to welcome Rebecca and Shwati back into the uh, room, so to speak. Yeah, thank you. I So that was, I really, really enjoyed all three of those talks. And I, uh, as we wait for questions, um i'll maybe say just a tiny little bit because i'm sure that there there will be you know many uh questions and i don't think anyone wants to hear from me anymore but uh so what i what i was thinking that you know kind of was a moment of intersection in all three talks was um was this idea that infrastructure you know the material world of infrastructure relies on an infrastructure of norms and in that sense, infrastructure sets those norms. And uh, I think one of the things that all of your talks did was try and find a way, look at bodies that are constantly defined as exceeding norms, exceeding the norms set by infrastructure that then give really may help you understand what, what the kind of norm is. And so this sort of 
constant being in excess of norms that uh, that 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 you know the santal body, the migrant body, the uh, uh, the polyglot body, the polyglot, I forgot the phrase that you use there, but you know, these, that these, uh, these moments are constantly um, defined by the norms, but they also find ways to exceed those norms. And I don't know, I mean, thought maybe that might be something to kind of begin a conversation with on, on the idea of, um, of how, we're like even in even the question uh, that even the even the concept that Abhishek brought up of like a surplus labor, you know, the the word itself uh, puts the body of that laborer as um, exceeding exceeding their own um, almost their own need to eat because th their surplus we can sort of therefore rely on uh, helping you know bring wages down in in a sense. So yeah, I just wanted to kind of point out to that uh, way in which all, all three papers sort of aimed at theorizing infrastructure through its outside, through its excess, while we wait for questions. But also taking also taking cues from what Atea says, I mean, also there's this question of descent here. I mean, imagine the Santal body or the migrant body. I mean, what, what, what is surplus to the normativity is also the question of descent. So these bodies are essentially dissenting in one way or the other. And for me, it's also about that question of visibility that seems to have be shared among all three of our, our subjects that, that there's, a, there's an invisibility of the Santals when they don't, when they disappear into their own infrastructures of small paths, that then they turn to build new infrastructures that can be seen, but that are sort of their own, um, protest against the prevailing colonial infrastructures and likewise you know the powerful um, visibility of the migrants on the highway it's like they've always been there they've always been visible it's just you haven't seen them right you haven't recognized them so this idea of recognition I think is also quite powerful um, in these things and I'd love to hear Shati talk more about this um, the way in which these maps that you showed kind of their, the colonial space or the colonial discourse is giving us, um, is reifying or reinforcing their own narrative, but they're also creating ways of, of producing the norm, right? So the norm sort of emerges through that process of mapping, right? I need a map is the response to that missive. You know, that, that was really telling, I thought. Now, I, when I read that first, you know, sitting in an archive looking at judicial proceedings, I thought, Imagine Richardson sitting there, what, what map? I, I don't have personnel to produce map, what map? I don't, you know, so the, but the normativity that we're talking about, um, I think infrastructures, cities, and here I'm thinking of um, Shrikal Chabria's work, making uh, the modern slum. She made a great point that what made the city was, what defined the city, was what was excluded. You know, the, the definition was a matter of exclusion. You exclude the workers' bodies, the migrant bodies from it. And that's how the city gets defined. So infrastructure gets defined by exclusion. And that is why it is always be the excess. It is always exceed what it is because it is defined like that. It is not a coincidence or you know, it just happens to be. So that's, I think, important for us to recognize if we are talking about state, and I make a distinction between state and corporate infrastructures, as opposed to you know, the kind that Rebecca, you were talking about, or I, what I anticipate uh, Abhishek's earlier work, uh, which I would be very interested in knowing more about, is about you know, the sort of uh, traveling as you know, other kinds of bodies traveling as opposed to the proper tourism that we think of is that's a particular kind of mobility. So, when we think about bodies traveling, bodies, you know, not being contained in space, what are the norms through which they are allowed to be visible? So it's kind of important to, you know, think about this. I would actually be very interested in hearing a little more from Abhishek about the, you know, connecting, I think, your earlier work with what you see in COVID in terms of the migrant workers or marginal 
you know, populations. Well, in the earlier work, I look at like certain dissenting bodies in the sense that I, I uh, take on the work of uh, the concept of unbecoming modern, like sort of Dubey's concept of unbecoming modern. So I look at this indigenous, quote unquote, in indigenous non normative uh, bodies and uh, like how people, for example, Rahul Shankritan and a bunch of other like Dinesh Chandrashen and all of, all, all of these bunch of uh, scholars, I mean, uh, if we may call them scholars, they wanted to travel, uh, which, which was symbolically a slap on the colonial government really, because the colonial government wanted to sedentarize them. And the more they wanted to sedentarize them, the more these people took to traveling. So which was basically a slap on the colonial governmentality. And they said, look, I'm just doing precisely what you are forbidding me to do. Uh, so, like, uh, there's a forthcoming uh, book in which uh, there's a chapter on uh, Rahul Shankritan, and I, I, I mean, he has this uh, interesting, uh, very skinny uh, book called Gudda Gumakkar Shastra, uh, mm -hmm. which has been translated in Bangla as Bhavagure Shastra, and these are like a set, sets of uh, like a presets for uh, the uh, someone who wants to be a vagabond, let's say. So he has a sets of do's and don'ts, and then I uh, and then I and then I looked into these. Uh, texts and, 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 I, and, and I deal with uh, certain traveling bodies who necessarily do not want to become modern. They, 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 they resist the statist uh, techniques and uh, biopolitical infrastructures that want them to sedentarize and, and let's say uh, to modern, the modernizing techniques of sedentarization. The part of Brojo and the, you know, the walking as a way of, you know, whether it's pilgrimage or um, just um, you know, uh, moving between, um, in this case, like what we were seeing, you know, between home and work, okay, this is not new. I mean, the, the assumption that earlier societies were somehow more sedentary, you know, the, the, the village community was more sedentary, and then suddenly capitalism happened, and then, you know, movement happened, yeah. you know, the, the hugely problematic notion. Um, that's the, a concept of the as well. them. Okay, that's what happened. Yeah. Yeah. So it's yeah. a... And of course, if you could recall Gandhi here, like the Gandhian march, the Gandhian yeah, walk, exactly. and of course the English expression walk out. I mean, walk out has a very really, uh, dissenting connotation by itself. We actually had a, a very good discussion about that. You know, what was Gandhi doing? I mean, here he had the railways, right? He had a very conflicted, you know, relation with the railways, right? Yeah, yeah, but yeah, um, yeah, 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 the, whole, yeah. the whole idea of the yeah. march, okay. And what what was it? I mean, uh, he for me, you, you, you know, thinking what way uh, Rebecca was also, he's building an infrastructure, right? But what is his infrastructure? Okay, so in def the new infrastructures are only built on defined other infrastructures, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah we can call them counter infrastructures, but you know, for I like to use the term infrastructure in a very capacious sense is that only infrastructure that matters is what lies underneath the threshold of visibility. Because I'm not interested in speaking, you know, talking in the language of the state. Okay, that's what we do when mm -hmm. we talk about dams, canals, etc. And I do that plenty. Yeah. Of okay. But then we are still kind of moving within that, you know, um, sort of vocabulary. And that becomes a self-fulfilling process, okay? And then of course, because of course you need roads in you know, uh, canals and dams. So like, no, let's not have the discussion. Let's have a different kind of discussion about what does infrastructure actually do, okay? So, so. Uh, we, we do have a question here. So I'm gonna read that. Uh, this is a question for Rebecca from Karen Sitzewitz. Uh, I'm interested in the relationship between counter infrastructure and counter public, particularly with regard to the centrality of public address in some of the best work on these language movements and their relationships to the art uh, to arts. Uh, I'm thinking of Frank Cody of Amanda Whiteman uh, on public address systems and Carnatic music and on Lisa Mitchell's critical repost to Sumati's work. The question is, I guess, is the counter in counter infrastructure the same as the counter in counter public? Um, thanks, Karen. It's wonderful um, to have you here in this conversation. Um, and this is a great question and something that I will really think hard about, because this is, this is, again, very new modes of thinking for me. Um, and, I, and I want to think about not just counter public, but what kinds of publics are created through these infrastructures. And I think that's part of 
the project of um, producing a community at Chola Mandal to kind of counter the prevailing music dance community in Madras, that you, that you actually start to produce or hopefully start to produce a kind of a patronage community and an elite community that can see the visual arts in a different way. Um, so I'm not sure how it might map onto the counter publics, but that is an excellent provocation and I will, I will be um, exploring that further. I'm sure you will get an email from me right after this. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm gonna read a question from Anu, um, from Anuraga Siddiqui. Thank you to all this. Thanks to all the speakers. You all used such urgent details, which make infrastructure into a terrain rather than a line or even a series of points or the bitumen and concrete that I Ati referred to. Talking about in, insurgency through infrastructure in this capacious way makes it so that insurgency cannot be narrated monolithically from only one point of view, but has to be narrated from many locations across this terrain. Can you speak to this a bit more? Um, and she mentions that actually Swati is, actually Swati, sorry, actually Shati is already speaking to this a bit. It would be great to hear about it through each speaker's work and more scholarly approaches. But why don't you, I mean, I, I could, um, uh, you know, let me respond briefly, okay, then you guys um, could, uh, probably, because you're working on different material, you probably have a very different understanding of this. Um, for me, what, how do people who have A, limited resources to capital, and B, a different kind of set of resources, it's not like they don't have resources, construct their infrastructure. This is what I looked at in, you know, unlearning the city because I was looking at visual culture and how certain kinds of visual culture create um, infrastructures and very powerful political infrastructures, okay? From community building to anti-colonial, uh, you know, um, political movements. So what I, I've been looking at uh, the Santal Rebellion for a while now, and my interest comes in from two, you know, uh, seminal books. One is Ranajit Kaur's work, the other is Prathama Banerjee's work. Okay, both have done exceptional work on that. Um, but the early work actually goes back to Kali Kingadatto, which was published in 1939. Uh, and then so there is, there is a kind of a way of thinking about the political implication of uh, the Santal Rebellion. The so more I have looked at it, more it seems to me is that it was, the insurgency itself was the infrastructure. In other words, if, if it is not a material thing that you can touch uh, you know, when we, when we think about roads even, when we think about the bitumen, et cetera, right? We think of it as a material thing, but you have to understand the materiality in other ways, okay? It has to do with speech. It has to do with movement. It has to do with, you know, the, um, the enigmatic uh, leaves that, you know, the scent um, to, as a warning, and you don't know what it means, right? That's the um, that that's the scare is that you were just delivered in the Sapori Rebel, it was chapatis. You were you know just delivered bread, and you have no idea what it was what it means. Okay, so you're constructing meaning, right? That proliferation is a very effective way of thinking about infrastructure. Actually, formal infrastructure also does that. It's an ember-like effect. So that's, so for me, if I really have to understand from the archives, and this is again, it's a prose of content insurgency, is that it is, um, they were using that as, the rebellion was a communication. That was what they needed to get to the state. Okay, they had tried before through other means, they could not. And I think it's productively, you know, um, connects with both Rebecca and Uvishek, both your um, different um, examples that you're looking at. Yeah, I mean, I can point to one connection to uh, Rebecca's uh, talk today, where, uh, which I thought was super interesting about, you know, Panikar's idea that this infrastructure should only last as long as it is necessary. And so, you know, what in, 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 if you think about it from there, the ruin of the infrastructure looks very different. What is a ruin, it, it, you know, the, one of the problems of concrete, of course, has been that it has left these ruins that will just last forever uh, or in, in states of degradation, not in any usable way. Um, and so what does it mean to think an infrastructure that doesn't produce these kinds of ruins? 
Yeah, I think there's something about, I mean, and, and the other thing too, is sometimes it's ruins and sometimes what's there, and I think this is the case in Chola Mandel, is sort of a inertial presence of the community and of the gallery and of the shared communal spaces that there's a, a weight of that on the next generation and the following generation to try to keep it up, but they may or may not have any interest in doing so. So there's a kind of how do you, there's also a kind of how do you gracefully sunset infrastructure, <laughs> right? Like how do you actually, how do you move on to something else that is going to be uh, productive? And I think that's actually a real problem um, with a lot of different infrastructures, as you say. I'm actually really interested. I, I think that the provocation here in terms of insurgency, um, you know, from Anu, Anurada's question is this idea of that, that I see in, in Abhishek's paper, and I just want to sort of get him to talk more about, is this idea of when does it become an insurrection? When does it become an insurgency? And I feel like even though the migrant workers walking on the highway wasn't organized in that way, that because it resonated with so many other images, like the Dundee salt march, that it, it sort of became an insurgency, just sort of almost uh, on its own agency. And I'm curious about that kind of um, sort of uh, undefined or consolidation, congealing of an insurgency when there wasn't really a plan for it in, in the beginning. Yeah, I mean, and that's why I precisely call it a metaphor. And uh, if we recall the image that uh, Shati had first showed us, I mean, the railway tracks, and if you recall, that was the image when 16 migrant workers were crushed under the railway. I mean, they were slipping on the tracks, assuming that the railway services has been suspended, but actually the goods train was still running. I mean, it's, it's a very powerful image in the sense that actually it didn't, didn't portray any migrant worker as such. I mean, they were all their belongings and a couple of rotis uh, spilled over. That's all, that's all, uh, what all the image had showed. I mean, that's a very powerful image in the in in, in the sense that uh, it, it acquires a metaphoric mm, value in 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 itself. So, in other words, what I'm trying to suggest is, I mean, there's this narrative of of uh, visibility and also denial. And if we recall, uh, and I remember this uh, news piece that appeared on on with with the same uh, like a few days after that. Uh, image uh, appeared on, on, on the national news. I mean, the state actually denied the whole uh, railway crushing because these people didn't have any citizenship documents to begin with. So, I mean, uh, although it ma made a national news and the image, image was so powerful and so potent to begin with, I mean, the state virtually denied it because they didn't have citizenship, like they didn't have papers to prove their citizenship. So in other words, like what I'm suggesting is this is narrative of uh, visibility and recognition on the one hand, which is uh, uh, counterpoised, let's say, with uh, with um, these narratives of denial. I think that's very important because um, and this is where the they are, you know, the idea of surplus labor, right? What makes labor surplus, right? The surplus, their bodies are um, surplus because they can be, you know, um, included into the regime when needed and thrown out when needed, right? They are in, in that sense, excess in multiple ways. They're excess in terms right. of violence, they're excess in terms of their indigeneity, they're excess in terms of you know, their unmodernity, and they are excess in terms of their labor because now they are not required, right? And yeah. the fact that, and this is what I said, you know, um, having, when I started uh, doing my last book's work, I was simply actually looking, I wasn't, you know, I didn't think of looking at infrastructure in the beginning. I was looking at nationalist movements, okay, and then you know contemporary um, the city building, and I made the connection like they are actually out of the built from the same sort of the framework. You know, it, it's not different. And what allows one to you know for the state to make the denial is because they are thinking about infrastructural connections, right? The road infrastructure is related to the Citizenship, citizenship Act, right? And other infrastructures. So it, it has to relate to with administration, right? It is related to what it connects. So the um, capacity of the state to connect infrastructures, but this is important, which is it can only do so through those infrastructures that it recognizes. It is blind in the face of other infrastructures. 
And that's the only reason why insurgencies can, can even happen, okay? Because it has that blindness. It has certain representational techniques, certain legal modes through which it can comprehend infrastructure. I'm going to read out this one uh, more question that we have from Otto Seme. Uh, thank you for a great lecture and further exploration of what is infrastructure, whether it is in maps, historical records, or metaphors. What do you think the role of design is in relation to your individual explorations and solutions to contemporary infrastructural problems? So, where you know we're not a group of designers here. Um, or lapsed designers in some cases, um, but maybe we have thoughts. I, you know, I, I'm one of those lapsed designers, so I, I'll make a uh, make a pass. Okay, I think one of the big problems we have is that we immediately jumped to the idea of design from problems of infrastructure that something must be built. You know. My challenge to my architect colleagues who teach in schools like yours is how, how do you practice architecture without building, without construction, okay? Because we don't need more buildings, we don't, okay? It's a matter of not more buildings, it's a matter of redistribution of resources. That's the problem, okay? So it's, how does one think of design not as construction, that's what I'm trying to say, okay? How do you think of design which presumes a certain kind of relation between present and future, sometimes the past, okay? It has a certain kind of temporal understanding. And this is where well, the discussion we just had about, you know, Panikar's idea that, you know, this is not permanent, right? You know, this will, you know, even if it stays, you know, it, it, it'll outlive its own um, uh, purpose and it then it might morph, it might become something else, okay? It has a certain kind of temporal imagination built into it. Most architectural infrastructural projects have a certain kind of temporal imagination built into it. And because it assumes, you know, the, the, presume that like the Roman bridges, they are they're going to last forever. You know, these are there's think of just the representation of infrastructures, you know, the pride people take in constructing that beautiful bridge, beautiful uh, flyover. I, I you know, my dad was a civil engineer. I'm absolutely sort of you know cued into that kind of pride. I think unless we can rethink what a design is, we will not be able to address any of the issues we're talking about today. I mean, I, I also, I'm not, uh, I don't come from a design background, uh, but I just wanted to second, uh, you know, what, uh, what Shati was just saying about the kind of um, dissolution, the sort of temporal uh, horizon uh, that I think should be perhaps more present, particularly in architectural design. I think it might be more present in other kinds of design that are seen as more ephemeral, like print media and things like that. Um, but one of the things I'm very interested in with Punnaker's move to, you know, he founds Cholamandal in part on the financing from craft production, which itself is bound up with a history of design in India. So there's a, an a sort of a sense of um, design. He's, he's created a intervention into the design world from his um, Madras art school artists in order to ground this new intervention into the infrastructure south of Chennai that is the Cholamandal artist village. Um, that then continues to kind of um, foment additional change and additional sort of interventions um, into the landscape, both the, the sort of physical landscape and into the landscape of aesthetics and of how, you know, what does it mean to have an aesthetics that is um, of this region that is 
through craft, what was called craft at the time. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in all of these intersections. Um, and I do think that they're, that, that Shati's call to, for an ethical um, architectural design, given that we have this temporal horizon, I think is incredibly important. So I'll just end there. Yeah, and I think uh, I, I'll read one more question that we have, uh, but I will say that I think the answer to the question is yes. It's from Yi Chen Li. It says, would you say that design also has the same blindness that makes insurgency possible? In, uh, let me um, address that. Um, Yi Chen, um, I think the idea of design, I always say you, know, you need to sort of unpack what it means to design. It's like you need to unpack infrastructure to understand infrastructure, you need to disassemble it. No design, you know, and this is where, you know, we think about, you know, the, the, even the metaphor of the master plan, you know, the, the presumption that you have a, a, a fully worked out solution when you know, I mean, in no architect or planner actually thinks it's like, you know, everything is worked out, right? But there is that desire, there is that um, sort of um, nominative notion of completion in it. No design is complete, even the ones that say they are. The problem is that their endpoints are worked out differently than one that has, a, you know, actually envisions an open horizon. Okay, so uh, design is uh, by actually, um, uh, by definition blind, okay? Because it's, uh, even in collaborative designs, they are, they're blind, okay? Because um, they cannot other, otherwise be, really. I mean, I think that's a, that's a sort of really potent point at which to kind of wrap up this. So I wanna sort of invite Rebecca and Avishek to say any final thoughts that they might have. Um, I was actually thinking as uh, Athea was responding to that, or sorry, as, um, as Swati was responding to that question that I wonder about design versus the maker, right? So I was thinking about the migrant workers who built the very highway that they were walking on in Avishik's presentation. And I wonder how much design they took into their own hands when building that highway right like whether, whether they walked over uh you know a flyover and said oh yeah no i i put my handprint on the you know on the concrete underneath this or i redid this you know this space means something different to me than it means to other people who are using it um, and that you know i think there's also that kind of idea of small interventions small insurgencies that might uh not be visible even even yet so i wanted to just put that out there and thank everybody for their conversation yeah, just to quickly conclude, I mean, uh, in my, in my understanding and my impression, the migrant worker would have just uh, executed the quote unquote master plan. Uh, and I think taking cues from what Shati just now pointed to, I think Levi Strauss would have much to say on this, the idea of uh, the master plan as opposed to uh, bricolaire, for example, the, the idea of the collage, which is, which is perennially incomplete. I think uh, I, th I think these are two notions and two very uh, paradigmatically different notions to uh, deal with. I think we have to, the, these are the two paradigms that we have to weigh out uh, against each other, like the model of the bricolor as opposed to the model of the uh, master plan as in, as in the blueprint. Thank you so much, and I, I I'm so grateful to have had be able to have you have this conversation today. And thank you to the audience and uh, Lila. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much.